Before we begin this session, don't forget to take advantage of the free resources available at practicingtheway.org. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Prayer Practice. Jesus had good things to say about those who hear his words and put them into practice. And you did that this week. You practiced prayer. We're so very happy you've chosen to come back together again with your community to hear more of Jesus' teaching on prayer and put them into practice in the week ahead. Over the four sessions, we're working through four types of prayer. Up for today is talking with God. But first, a practice in the way we believe the reflection is key in the spiritual life. As the professor Trevor Hudson once said, we don't change from experience, we change when we reflect on our experience. Mm -hmm. Much of learning to follow Jesus is learning to notice the movement of God without and within us. So we hope you made time to fill out the practice reflection in your companion guide. Now we're going to invite you to break into triads, groups of three or so people, and share from your reflection with as much vulnerability as you're comfortable with. And please don't feel any pressure to say you did something that you didn't mm -hmm. or claim that you like something you didn't like. Just be honest. Here are three questions to guide your time. The first, where did you feel resistance in prayer, internally or externally? Your phone, your to-do list, lack of desire for God? Second, where did you feel delight? Where did your soul come alive or find joy? And the third, where did you most experience God's nearness? For some of you, naming this will be a new skill, but it's so helpful. Take a few minutes to reflect together before the teaching. Just a few nights ago, we had our friends over for dinner. They have two little kids, a baby and a preschooler. The baby is just learning to talk. All night long, he was making noises that I could not decipher for the life of me, but I was watching his mom and dad teach him to speak. Say hi, say please, say thank you. Teaching the child to talk to me and others. The preschooler, on the other hand, had a basic grasp of the English language and was learning to talk with people. At the very end of the night, she even came up to me and, shy and bashful, asked me a question and then sat there in a squirrely four-year-old kind of way, listening for my reply. Both children are going through a God-created process of learning how to communicate and commune with others. In a similar way, we are working through a four-stage progression in the life of prayer, talking to God, talking with God, listening to God, and being with God. And while the spiritual journey is not linear, most of us learn to pray just like children. First, we learn the vocabulary and grammar of life with God. Say, Daddy, say, Mommy, say, Our Father who is in heaven, to talk to God. But there comes a time when we desire a more personalized relationship to God, more grounded in the highs and lows of our particular life, so we begin, most of us intuitively, to talk with God. All I mean by that is to tell him what's on our mind. Turn again in your Bibles to Luke chapter 11. We see this progression from talking to God to talking with God in Jesus' central teaching on prayer. We left off last session in verse 4. Let's pick it up in verse 5. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. This is a rabbinic form of teaching that New Testament scholars call how much more. It's Jesus' way of drawing attention to a particular point. 
His point is not that God is the grumpy neighbor with a do not disturb sign on his front door, but if you bang loud enough, he'll give you what you really want. It's if the grumpy, begrudging neighbor will answer your request, how much more will our Father? Jesus goes on, verse 9, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. And then notice, Jesus goes straight to the metaphor of a father and his child. Verse 11, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Did you see the progression? Jesus starts by teaching his disciples to talk to God, meaning to pray a pre-made prayer. When you pray, recite this, our Father who is in heaven. But he assumes his disciples will move on to talk with God, to come to our Father with all that we need and desire. This progression is kind of like learning to play music. I played in bands for years, and the first thing you do with music is learn basic music theory and scales and chords on your guitar. You have to first learn to play other people's music, before you can learn to write your own music. When you watch a savant like John Coltrane, he's so mastered all the ins and outs of music that now he's just feeling his way into each song. In the same way, we begin to pray by learning the basics of life with God, but then we move on to just riffing in our conversations with our Father, or what we are calling talking with God. Now, under the second category of talking with God, there are three subcategories. They are gratitude, talking with God about what is good in your life and world, lament, talking with God about what is evil in your life and world, and petition and intercession, asking God to fulfill his promises to overcome evil with good. A short word on each. First off, gratitude. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order, said the beginning point for this type of more interactive prayer is to, quote, give thanks to God our Lord for the benefits received. He called ingratitude a failure to recognize the good things, the graces, and the gifts received. As such, he said, ingratitude is the cause, beginning, and origin of all evil and sin. Think of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Their sin was ultimately a failure to receive their life as a gift, but rather an attempt to take it as a right. And while human rights is a thoroughly Christian concept, we must hold it in harmony with the fact that ultimately, life is a gift, not a right. Therefore, gratitude isn't just the beginning of prayer, it's the heart and soul of our entire relationship to God. At the center of the divine dance we call the Trinity is a generous, joyful, self-giving, others-focused love. It is written, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. And of Jesus, he gave himself for our sins. The Father gave the Son, and the Son gave his life, and the Father and the Son together gave the Holy Spirit. Generosity is at the center of the gospel and the inner nature of the triune God himself. Therefore, gratitude is the primary way we relate to God. Paul writes that we are to be overflowing with thankfulness. The Jesuit priest Timothy Gallagher says this, recognizing God's loving gifts and recognizing God's loving presence through them, summarized by the word gratitude, lies at the very heart of our relationship with God. One way to measure your spiritual maturity is by your level of genuine, unforced thankfulness. It's been said that to be a saint is to live on grateful joy. It's to see all of your life as a gift. Secondly is lament, talking with God about what is evil in your life and world. 
The honest truth is our life and world are both full of things that are not good or beautiful, but are ugly and evil. What are we to do with all the pain and suffering we carry in our heart? Pray it. As Pete Gregg, the founder of 24-7 Prayer, would say, pray what you got. If you have gratitude, pray that. Grief, pray that. Fear, pray that. Anger, pray that. It's an open secret that many Christians find prayer boring. One reason for that is because they aren't actually praying. They're performing. We are so used to performing our life with other people. We edit our thoughts and words to present a more polished image of ourselves to the world in order to be loved and not rejected and to succeed and not fail. It's like we can't help but carry that way of being over into our relationship to God. But C.S. Lewis said, we are to lay before God what is in us, not what ought to be in us. Learning to pray is about learning to bring all we are to God because he already knows all that's inside us. I think of Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You perceive my thoughts from afar. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. Talking honestly with God about our pain is a type of prayer we call lament. It's very rare in modern worship music, but it was very common in ancient worship. Read the Psalms, the so-called prayer book of the Bible. Scholars tell us that approximately two-thirds of the Psalms are lament. Read them. They are full of rage, anger, vengeance, jealousy, envy, doubt, suicidal ideation, and worse. Why would God put that in Scripture and as a template for how to pray? Because we are full of rage and anger and vengeance and more. One way of thinking about lament is as an emotionally healthy way of processing the pain of your life and world with God, learning to complain not about God, but to God. Because if we don't complain to God, we'll end up complaining to our spouse or our friend group or our boss or our pastor or the internet. We'll vent and rage and criticize and just leak emotional waste into the atmosphere. Another way of thinking about lament is as a theological protest, how you protest God himself, or at least the events of God's world. Our generation is all about protest and speaking truth to power and the social media rant. What if we were to channel at least some of that pent up anger and angst into prayer? The social activist J.T. Thomas calls this pray test and argues this kind of praying against evil and injustice does something both through us and in us. It's a way of fighting not against God, but with God and against evil. As Anne Voskamp has said, lament is a cry of belief in a good God, a God who has his ear to our hearts, a God who transfigures the ugly into beauty. Now we're getting into the third category. Lament will naturally lead you into petition and intercession, asking God to fulfill his promises to overcome evil with good. Petition is when we ask God to do something on our behalf. God, help me get a job or make rent or put food on the table or know what to do in a tricky situation with my kid. Intercession is when we ask God to do something on someone else's behalf. It's a priestly work, standing before God on behalf of people and people on behalf of God. An intercession at its best is a form of love, a way to carry one another's pain into God's healing light. And both petition and intercession, which are two sides of the same coin, are summarized by Jesus' command to ask. Paul Miller, in his book, A Praying Life, writes, All of Jesus' teaching on prayer in the Gospels can be summarized with one word, ask. Over and over again, Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. He regularly says to people, what do you want me to do for you? Many of us have thought about a problem in our life many times, but we have never stopped to ask Jesus to do something about it. But the 19th century Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon said, whether we like it or not, Asking is the rule of the kingdom. And the single most important thing Jesus teaches his disciples about asking is not just to ask, but to ask in Jesus' name. For example, 
Just a few chapters later in John, Jesus says, I will do whatever you ask in my name. Most people put the tagline, in Jesus' name, at the end of their prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. But not once is it used that way in the New Testament. If it goes anywhere in a prayer, it should go at the beginning, not the end. Because it's not a magic incantation you add to the end of your prayer to get what you want, like the open sesame of the kingdom of God. It's a way of praying. There are at least two dimensions to asking in Jesus' name. The first is to invoke our status as those who are in Christ or in Jesus. The New Testament scholar Larry Hurtado put it this way, to pray in Jesus' name means that we enter into Jesus' status in God's favor and invoke Jesus' standing with God. It means that when we come before our Father, we come as sons and daughters, not as beggars off the street, but as princes and princesses who have been adopted into the family through Christ, our brother, what the New Testament writer Paul calls co-heirs with Christ. We come in the name and authority of King Jesus with access to the full resources of his kingdom. The second dimension is to pray in alignment with Christ. In the ancient world, a person's name was a synonym for their nature or character. We ask in Jesus' name when we ask for the kinds of things that Jesus himself would ask for if he were in our situation. That is the sacred alignment through which the miraculous power of God can flow. This is why if you pay close attention to the prayers of scripture, be it from Moses in the Old Testament or Paul in the New, They don't pray problems, they pray promises. They call on God to do what they know he desires to do. But to pray in Jesus' name, we must come to believe that our prayers actually make a difference in what does or does not happen. The theologian Walter Wink said this beautifully. Intercessory prayer is spiritual defiance of what is in the name of what God has promised Intercession visualizes an alternative future to the one apparently faded by the momentum of current forces. Prayer infuses the air of a time yet to be into the suffocating atmosphere of the present. History belongs to the intercessors who believe the future into being. Even a small number of people firmly committed to the new inevitability on which they have fixed their imaginations can decisively affect the shape the future takes. These shapers of the future are the intercessors. Tragically, very few modern Christians actually believe this, that through prayer we can, quote, decisively affect the shape the future takes, much less think of prayer as spiritual defiance. Few of us live with Jesus' worldview, what some theologians call a warfare worldview, that sees humanity as besieged by evil forces and Jesus as its savior come to liberate occupied territory with the kingdom of God and prayer is how we join Jesus in the fight. There is a deadly undercurrent of determinism in the modern church. Like the ancient Greeks, many believe we are trapped by the fates. Listen to the philosopher Dallas Willard on this conundrum. God's response to our prayers is not a charade. He does not pretend that he is answering our prayer when he is only doing what he was going to do anyway. Our requests really do make a difference in what God does or does not do. The idea that everything would happen exactly as it does regardless of whether we pray or not is a specter that haunts the minds of many who sincerely profess belief in God. It makes prayer psychologically impossible, replacing it with dead ritual at best. Of course, this is not the biblical idea of prayer, nor is it the idea of people for whom prayer is a vital part of life. Think again of the Lord's Prayer and that line, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus assumes, one, that the kingdom of God's will has not yet come and that his will is not yet done, at least not in full. And two, he assumes that prayer actually makes a difference in what does or does not happen. 
Of course, this raises all sorts of questions about the tension between God's power and good intentions, or what some call his sovereignty or providence, and human free will, not to mention demonic free will. Is prayer something God is doing in me or something I am doing with God? It's both. God is king of the world, but his world is besieged by evil, and he's not a dictator. He hasn't totally taken his hands off the wheel, but he really has entrusted a level of management of the world to his sons and daughters. And prayer is one of the ways we steward our task as co-rulers with Jesus in his world and fight for its liberation. The Reformed theologian R.C. Sproul said it this way, The prayer of his people is one of the means God uses to bring things to pass in this world. So if you ask me whether prayer changes things, I answer with an unhesitating yes. To pray is both a moral responsibility and a spiritual opportunity to partner with God to bend the arc of human history in the direction of his kingdom. But as we pray, we must never forget that whether we come to God with gratitude or lament or petition and intercession, through it all, God is forming us into the answers to our own prayers. Prayer is the way we ask God to do things only he can do in the world. And it's a way of giving God the time and space to do what only he can do in us. So, This coming week, as you practice gratitude and lament and petition and intercession, may our anthem be your kingdom come and your will be done on earth and in my life and our community as it is in heaven. Thanks for listening. Normally at this point in the practice, we pause for group discussion. But since the practice of prayer is one we can do together, we're going to invite you to pause and pray. You may want to pray one at a time, or as some call it, popcorn style. But you should know that many Christians around the world actually pray out loud all at once. In Korea, they call it tongsonggido, which literally means praying together out loud. I grew up in a church that prayed this way and have always found that it keeps prayer communal and lively. But whether you pray all at once or one at a time, we recommend you take a few minutes for gratitude, a few minutes for lament, and then end with a time of petition and intercession. Go ahead and pray now. Hey. My name is Trey and I live in Portland, Oregon. Prayer makes all the difference and that's been hard for me to understand. I wanna put my body in a place. I wanna put my action out in front of people and, uh, and I want people to follow me if I'm really honest, sometimes in my pride. And I think sadly, a lot of those things in today's world, especially within the justice movement, a lot of those things are able, are, are able to be captured on different media platforms. And so I think that is why it feels like that needs to be the number one response is something that is able to be captured by a camera, by a a, a podcast, anything. What I've actually come to believe is that there are unseen factors at play and that there are actual spiritual forces who are not only opposing me, but they're opposing my culture, they're, they're opposing my city. There's someone out there who's looking to actually still kill and destroy. And, and to go into prayer is to enter into a posture of humility, where it's saying, I don't have all the answers, and I definitely do not hold all of the power, but I am intimately connected to the one who does have the answers and to the one who does hold the power. And in my belief with Jesus is I'm ultimately connected to the Prince of Peace. And through the Prince of Peace, we can actually taste justice, we can taste righteousness. And it's something that's not paper thin, it actually has deep roots. And so to me, it is countercultural to go to prayer and thank God that I'm willing to be countercultural and that other people are willing to be countercultural. But what has been the result a lot of times, I think, is not long-lived. You don't see the heart posture of people change, and that's because that's God's business. 
God changes people, He changes hearts, He redeems things that are deeper. And so to go into prayer first is actually how you can make a real difference when it comes to justice. Now it's time to look at the week ahead. We have three exercises for you to practice. But first, remember that prayer is not a technique to master because the whole point of prayer is to be mastered by God and in doing so, be set free. Think of this practice as learning new relational skills with God. That said, our first exercise is to continue to fine tune your daily prayer rhythm. It can take a really long time to figure out your daily prayer routine, where to pray, when to pray, how to pray. And it's a moving target in the different seasons of our lives. So we're always fine tuning, asking things like what's working and what's not. Let me give you two things to consider incorporating into what you started last week. First, find an aid or a ritual to help you transition in and out of prayer. Many like to light a candle or sit in silence for a few minutes or step outside and go for a walk. It can be anything that helps you unhurry and recenter on God's presence. Also, use your body in prayer. Mm. We have an embodied faith and a wandering mind, so position matters a lot in prayer. Biblically, the most common way to pray is standing up and even lifting your hands. But you can also pray kneeling or lying face down or walking or like Jesus by climbing a mountain. Different postures are more conducive to different types of prayer. Just experiment with your body and your daily prayer rhythm. Secondly, begin or end your day with gratitude. Since there's no right way to pray gratitude, you can feel free to be creative. You can do this to begin your daily prayer rhythm or while driving home from work or as you lay in bed at night. You can keep a gratitude journal or write out your gratitudes on a scrap of paper and carry them in your pocket throughout the day. You can go around the table at breakfast or dinner and say what you're thankful for. Gratitude will naturally lead us to praise, where we celebrate not just what God has done, but who God is. But the exercise is at least once a day, pause and give thanks for at least three good things in your life. Finally, ask. Step into petition and intercession and ask on behalf of both yourself and others. We have two recommended exercises in the guide to do this. The first is prayer cards, where you make a deck of cards with the names or situation at the top of each card, and you just flip through them and linger over each one for a few minutes, offering our specific prayers to our Father. Or you can just do one card with the most important people or situations in your life. You can also include your enemies, as praying for them mm. can set your heart free to love them. The second is an exercise called praying the room, where you just imagine yourself in a room with our Father or Jesus, and then ask the Holy Spirit to bring into the room anyone or anything that he's wanting you to intercede for. Then begin to pray for whomever or whatever comes to mind. More instructions are available for you in the companion guide. For those of you who want to go further, our reach exercise for this week is to pray your own lament. You may find it helpful to write your own, or you may find it more helpful to start with a psalm of lament. And we have several recommendations of this in the guide. Or you may want to go somewhere else where you are alone and vent your feelings to God. As an aid, we have a video tutorial from Strawn Coleman available where he guides you through a time of lament and you create space to offer all that is in you to God. We're also in chapters four to six in our recommended reading, as well as listening to episode two of the Rule of Life podcast. Finally, this is your official reminder to fill out the practice reflection mm -hmm. before you come back together for session three. Again, everything we offer is invitational. We make recommendations, you make decisions. But in the week ahead, may Jesus teach you to pray, to commune and communicate with our Father, and lead you into a deeper life of union with the Holy Spirit.